The morselator is increasing the occurrence of uterine cancer while the FDA sits silent. See the story at DrugSafetyNews.com. Recently, I interviewed attorney Tim O'Brien about the lawsuit that he and Mike Papantonio and several other attorneys have been handling against DuPont for polluting an entire town with a chemical known as C8. Ring of Fire Radio Sam Cedar had the chance to speak with Tim the other day where they went into even further uh, detail on this issue. So let's take a look at that interview. Tim, for people who have not followed the story, and there's been a lot uh, written as of late in uh, the New York Times and whatnot, um, tell us the story. What is about uh, about C8? What What is C8? Where was it made? How do we even know about this? Well, C8 came into the public parlance several years ago, really about 20 years ago, in the context of a, a condition known as toxic fume fever or Teflon fever, where people were getting ill when these Teflon pans were giving off uh, gas. As litigation concerning a certain farmer in West Virginia whose cattle were dying because runoff from a DuPont plant in West Virginia was ending up in his stream that ran across his cattle land, that's when the litigation began. And that's when one uh, gentleman by the name of Rob Allott, an attorney in Ohio, began digging into this. And what was discovered was that this DuPont plant in Parkersburg, West Virginia, called Washington Works, which produced all the Teflon uh, in the United States for DuPont. That's DuPont's product. Using a chemical, a processing agent, a surfactant known as C8, which was made by 3M up in Minnesota. 3M shipped this product to DuPont to use as they would, and DuPont used it. The problem here is, Sam... Tim, let me just clarify something, too, for, for folks who don't know necessarily the terminology. C8 is not in Teflon. It is a um, it is a an industrial chemical that is used in the in the making of Teflon. Right. It's a it's it's almost as if it was a machine. But in this instance, it's a chemical. It is a, a certain very small amount ends up in Teflon. But you're absolutely right. It's a processing agent that is not the product itself, but it's the manufacturing agent that helps DuPont actually basically disperse Teflon evenly across a pan or across, uh, you know, a spatula or anything that would have the Teflon coating on it. Interesting. And, and, and I, should, I should tell people, in terms of that first case that Rob Belot took of that farmer, um, that farmer shot some video, and yeah. that farmer has since uh, passed, as far as, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. But the video is available. I think uh, The Intercept did a story on this, and the video is available online. And it's really disturbing stuff. I mean, he's going through and looking at the death of his cattle. And this is a guy who's been, you know, a cattle um, a rancher for a, a long time. And what he was looking at, he knew was, was different in some way. Right. What, what he, he put two and two together, and he contacted Rob, who's our trial partner on these cases, with uh, Mike Papantonio, my partner. And what the Mr. Tennant, the farmer, found was, wow, my, my creek is black and it's foamy. And so, it smells bad. There's something, something wrong uh, in, in this creek. And then he not only was seeing his cows dying and in agony, but he also saw many uh, herds of deer were dying on his property all around this stream. And where the stream came from was from a landfill on the DuPont property in, into which the C8 uh, waste was being disposed of, um, completely in di- disregarding the instructions DuPont did that had been given to it by the actual manufacturer of C8 who sold it to DuPont, and that's 3M. So 3M gave DuPont very special instructions on how to handle this hazardous chemical, and DuPont just flat out ignored those instructions. And I mean, it's 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 quite obvious. But but why do you think they ignored those instructions? Well, I think that the po- the folks at DuPont put it best. The real reason is, of course, money. It right. would cost uh, DuPont or the Washington Works plant about a million, a million and a half a year to totally eliminate C8 from any type of pollution, uh, whether it's through discharge into the Ohio River, whether it's through the smokestacks. And because of the way they confederate at DuPont, because they slice and dice the department heads 
uh, budgets down to the smallest common denominator, uh, the, the, the business leader said, wow, this is too expensive for the Teflon division, even though it costs the company really nothing. So the long and short of it is you have a billion-dollar portfolio, which is Teflon. And the, the powers that be at DuPont said, well, in order to follow 3M's recommendations and incinerate this product out of existence, uh, that would cost us about a million, a million two of this billion-dollar-a-year portfolio. And the decision was made, well, no, we'd rather keep that million dollars a year in-house and all of the C8 out of our house and into the Ohio River. And and we should say this is this is a classic case of a business basically saying we're going to uh, increase our profit margins by uh, shuttling the expense to society at large and hope that uh, we never have to account for it. And I certainly imagine those people who were impacted uh, by this had wished that they would never have had to uh, absorb that. Um, uh, that expense, but it turned out they they not only absorbed uh, the chemical, but they, it had um, incredibly bad health impact on them. So what happens after this? Rob Ballot takes the case, uh, and uh, this is in the um, I guess the mid '90s. What 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 then happens? I mean, how does how is the line drawn from uh, from Dupont's dumping this uh, C8 chemical into the water? to the impact it had on uh, on human health. Well, to, to take a long a decade of, of history and try and condense it, let me just say this. Rob uh, essentially found out that not only were they putting this pollutant into the dump next to Mr. Tennant's property, but as he also found out that they were actually discharging it directly into the Ohio River and including into the air. And he found internal documents where DuPont knew in the early 1980s that this C8 was not staying put, that it had an affinity for water, that it followed wherever water goes, the C8 will go. It is not absorbed by the dirt, like so many other things in our, in our, in our atmosphere. So what happened is the C8 actually finds its way into dozens of, of aquifers which supply the water supp uh, the water supply districts in this mid Ohio Valley and as studies began being conducted an alarming truth was found which is number one and DuPont knew this this chemical is known as a bio persistent chemical which means it does not leave your body for decades once it's there and number two it was concentrating because it stacks so if you drink C8 that C8 that you just drunk uh, ingested doesn't leave then you drink more c8 and then it stacks and then you drink more c8 and it stacks on top of the stack stacked now and so people were getting very high levels of serum concentrations of c8 and in the mid 2000s as part of a class settlement that rob balat was involved with uh, the court ordered dupont to start conducting some medical monitoring to start doing some studies and at the end of this process, what was discovered by an independent scientific panel approved by the court, what was discovered was this biopersistent chemical that DuPont knew that it had been polluting the Ohio River with since 1951, that DuPont knew caused cancer, that DuPont knew uh, for decades was, was toxic, um, that it had been linked, that it, the scientists had found that the diseases that uh, were being caused by C8 included kidney cancer, testicular cancer, a, a horrible inflammatory bowel disease known as ulcerative colitis, just to name a few. So the long and short of it was that it was the litigation uh, that, that Rob began with and then brought us into that really exposed not only to the public but more importantly to the EPA um, DuPont's dirty laundry, and finally, about one year ago, the EPA finally got DuPont to pull C8 to quit using C8. But the problem is, 
that well, Tim, the, the, let's, the chemicals let's take... bio persistent. It's there for decades to come. It's not going anywhere for decades now. And instead of um, disposing of it a proper way, because it would have cost them extra money to do so, they began to basically just dump this stuff. And there was a belief, and this was sort of fascinating to me, and this sort of, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, I'm constantly looking for uh, some type of explanation how people can engage in this type of behavior, that um, many chemicals, when they are dumped, they get absorbed by the dirt and they just stay there. And as long as nobody dredges it up, the chemicals aren't going anywhere. But this C8 apparently was not absorbed by the dirt. And therefore, it leached into all these aqueducts, as you say. And uh, through a series of litigations, an independent medical board was set up. And, and pick up the story again. I know you're repeating a little bit, but what did that independent medical board find? And my understanding is that in the context of litigations, having a board like this that was funded by DuPont was a fairly rare occurrence, right? That, that they could, these epidemiologists could come in and actually measure what, what is the impact of this chemical being dispersed in such a wide radius? Right. What, what, what happened with this class settlement was perhaps one of the greatest victories litigation has ever known in terms of not only trying to do justice by the victims, but also doing justice for knowledge. Because the massive amount of money that, that DuPont was required to pay into these studies looked not only at you know published literature and, and certain dry statistics, Instead, it looked at the people actually impacted, the 70,000 people who live in the six water districts, which immediately surround the Washington Works plant. And so this is, you kind of think of it as a really huge, living, breathing clinical trial uh, where, where, and it all came about through, through litigation where there was a hunch that something was wrong because of these dead cattle. And within seven years, DuPont was being compelled to do this. And the data that came out showed that, number one, this, this chemical is biopersistent, which DuPont clearly knew no later than 1979. They used that term. They knew it was biopersistent. And from their own employees, their studies on their own employees, they knew it was biopersistent on the order of decades, that it would stay in your body for decades once it was introduced. Mm-hmm. But these scientists who look at it, the C8 science panel who looked at this, looked at and very carefully examined data uh, and looked at the occurrences. And it wasn't simply, oh, there's a bunch of cancer cases in this one water district. It was a thorough and sifting examination of multiple lines of evidence. And they came to the conclusion without any, any hesitation that, yes, it's linked to kidney cancer, testicular cancer, this ulcerative colitis, among several other Ill, Ill illnesses. And this never would have happened um, but for the intrepid efforts of, uh, of, a, of a person representing a cattle farmer right outside the DuPont plant in West Virginia. Now, let me ask you this, Tim, and maybe this, this might be sort of beyond um, uh, your scope or, or just uh, uh, the general scope of knowledge at this point. But if this C8 had this type of impact on people within, let's say, about a 25-mile radius of this uh, factory that was leaching it. But the C8 has the ability to basically not get absorbed by dirt, that it travels through water, it seems, uh, seamlessly and aggressively in some respects. Um, How do we know this is where it's limited to? I mean, you know, because my presumption is is that these epidemiologists were not looking at the universe. They were looking within a, um, a, a, a specific um, uh, a distance from the factory. But we don't know if a high concentration of C8 made it down one tributary and ended up in one other aquifer somewhere, I don't know, 50 miles away, 100 miles away. I mean, do we have any sense of that? Oh, yes. It's, it's sad. Um, And and here's what, so the the scientists looked at what they call the Brookmar data set, which is about 69,000 people. And they really concentrated their efforts on studying the immediate uh, surrounding areas. But recent research out of the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, and and Cincinnati is on the Ohio River, 
285 miles downstream from the Washington Works plant. They studied young girls. Um, they selected a population of young girls, uh, preteen girls, for the sole purpose of seeing whether the C8 made its way into their bloodstream, 285 miles downstream. And what they found, this is research that came out at the end of about a year ago, at the end of 2014, uh, what they found was these young girls have these alarmingly high uh, concentrations of serum C8, and here they are almost 300 miles downstream. And the reason mm. why this is so, and it cannot be disputed by anyone, is that this, this C8 toxin, it, it's like a nano poison. It takes so little to have a major impact, uh, a major threat to human health. It, 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 it's such a little dangerous little molecule that you have to measure it in parts per billion. And what the science panel found was you could have 20 parts per billion of water. And if there's one part per billion of C8 in it, that is enough to cause these cancers and these other conditions. So it doesn't take much for that C8 to survive. One little magic bullet in a movie theater finds its way downstream and it concentrates in people downstream. It is a very fluid, very aggressive, very quickly moving nanotoxin that doesn't find a place to rest until it finds a body. Well, um, uh, Tim O'Brien, thanks for uh, catching us up on this case. Thanks for having me on, Sam.